Chapter 2 Clyde The Echelon Security Network is the world's most sophisticated electronic surveillance system. It is jointly run by the United States National Security Agency and the intelligence services of several friendly nations, including Great Britain and Australia. Echelon monitors communications, including telephone calls, emails and faxes passing via microwave links, communication satellites and fibre optic cables. The system currently scans 9 billion private messages and conversations per day. Every hour, approximately 1 million messages containing trigger words such as bomb, terrorist, napalm or phrases such as help earth or al-Qaeda are picked out and stored by the system. These suspicious messages are run through logic analyzing software that is capable of determining the emotional state of a person from their voice or the likely context of suspicious words in an email or text message. Of the million messages stored each hour by Echelon, about 20,000 will be flagged by the computer and read by one of 2,000 monitoring staff on duty at any given time. In late 2005, an Echelon station in Southeast Asia intercepted an email message between two unknown parties. The email mentioned a possible Help Earth attack in Hong Kong and the involvement of a 16-year-old environmental campaigner named Clyde Shu. Rather than arresting the young suspect, it has been decided to infiltrate Shu's family in the hope that more senior figures within Help Earth can be uncovered. Excerpt from a Cherub mission briefing for Kyle Blumen, Kerry Chang and Bruce Norris. Hong Kong, February 2006 Kerry Chang broke into a jog when she spotted Rebecca Shu leaning against a lamppost waiting for her. The two 13-year-olds wore school uniform. Blue blouse, navy skirt and pullover, white tights, and were mixed up with hundreds of others dressed the same way. Some were heading home alone, some stood in groups gossiping, while others cut precariously into four lanes of snarled up traffic, trying to catch a double-decker bus parked at a stop on the opposite side of the road. Good day? Kerry asked, speaking in Cantonese. Rebecca shrugged. School, school, you know how it goes. Kerry knew how she felt. When an undercover mission drags on, the person you're pretending to be starts getting mixed up with who you really are. She'd now been attending Prince of Wales School for six weeks and had settled into a rut. Rebecca started walking. Aren't we waiting for Bruce? Kerry asked. Detention, Rebecca smiled. I thought you knew. Your brother's such an idiot. Stepbrother, Kerry said. No shared genes, thank you very much. What's he gone and done now? Oh, just him and his stupid mates yapping all through maths class. Mr. Lee chucked a mental and told them to come back after school. Kerry shook her head. I wish I was in your class. I've got nobody to talk to all day. Rebecca smiled but we'd probably get in trouble for chatting all the time. The air-conditioned school was always chilly, but it was sunny out and Kerry got hot as they headed home. She loosened her tie, then pulled her sweater over her head and knotted it around her waist. The 15-minute walk took the two girls through a maze of high buildings, cramped streets and elevated walkways choked by fumes from speeding traffic. Home for both girls was a recently built tower block 20 storeys high. It had five identical cousins, the last of which was still under construction. Hong Kong's sea air and tropical climate eats buildings, and despite its newness, the balconies stretching skywards already looked tatty. In most wealthy countries, cramped apartment blocks like these would house the poor. But Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated cities in the world, and this accommodation was mostly home to professional types. 
Rebecca's family was typical. Her father was a dentist, and her mother part owned a jeweler's shop in an upscale mall. The doors parted automatically as the girls passed into a muggy lobby. The security guard gave them a friendly nod from behind his desk. Have you got much homework? Kerry asked as they waited for the elevator up to the ninth floor where they both lived. A fair bit, Rebecca said. We can do it together. Or surf the net, whatever. Cool, Kerry said. But I'm going to go in my place and lose the uniform first. I'll see you around yours in ten minutes. The front door of the cramped apartment led directly into the kitchen. Kerry yawned as she stepped inside. She dumped her backpack on the floor and skidded her keys across the dining table. Assistant Mission Controller Chloe Blake leaned through the doorway leading into the living room. Hi, Kerry. Where's Bruce? Detention. Oh, great, Chloe said, looking stressed. What's up? Are you doing homework with Rebecca tonight? Kerry nodded. As soon as I'm changed. Why? What's going on? You'd better look at this. Kerry moved through to the living room. 16-year-old Kyle Blumen, Kerry's other stepbrother for the purposes of this mission, was sitting on the couch dressed in shorts and a t-shirt. No school? Kerry asked. Clyde Shoes skipped out of our English class this morning, Kyle explained. I followed him down to the harbour, but I had to keep my distance and lost him at a busy crossing. John picked up a couple of mobile calls in the surveillance suite back at the hotel, but they didn't tell us much. All we know is that Clyde met with someone at an Arby's in the business district around lunchtime. Any idea who? Kerry interrupted. Not even a name, Kyle said. But after the meeting, Clyde came back here to the shoe's apartment. We've got it on video. Chloe flipped up the lid of her laptop, which was connected to a satellite antenna on the balcony. She double-clicked, opening up a video file which Kerry leaned in to watch. The fisheye image was from an ultra-wide angle camera that Bruce had sneaked into the light fitting above Clyde Shoe's bed four weeks earlier. When was this recorded? Kerry asked. A couple of hours ago, Chloe replied. The screen showed Clyde Shue walking into his tiny bedroom. He sat on his bed, then pulled off his trainers and school shirt, revealing a muscular chest. He's so fit, Kerry said. Totally, Kyle grinned. Cutest little terrorist I've ever seen. Chloe tutted. Oh, can you two keep the raging hormones under control and concentrate on what you're watching? Clyde Shue pulled a small cellophane wrapped package out of his school backpack, then leaned forwards. He opened a chest of drawers and tucked it under a pile of socks. Any idea what that is? Kerry asked. Impossible to tell, Chloe said but you don't go to all that trouble to meet someone and come back with something you could have bought from the 7-Eleven, do you? Can you try and get a look at it? Maybe take some photos? Kerry looked uncertain. Couldn't we wait until tomorrow and go in when the shoes are out at work and school? It would be easier, Chloe said, but that's 15 or 16 hours away. Who's to say Clyde won't have passed the package on to someone else by then? Knowing what's in that package now might be the difference between foiling an attack and hundreds of innocent people losing their lives. Well, Kerry said, shaking her head, it's going to be tricky without Bruce there keeping an eye out. He's such a knob, getting himself in trouble on the one day we need him. Chloe clicked a few icons on the laptop screen, making the display switch to a live feed from the shoe's apartment. Between them, Kerry and Bruce had managed to place a miniature camera and microphone in every room. Well, Chloe said as she flipped between the live pictures from six different cameras. Rebecca is in her room, 
Clyde is on the computer in his parents' room, and we can rely on mum and dad not being home before seven o'clock. Kerry nodded. You can't get Clyde off that PC once he's online. Rebecca always has to fight with him when she wants to go and play Sims 2. Do you think you'll be safe going into the room without Bruce covering you from outside? Kerry shrugged. I can probably talk my way out if they catch me in the room, but if I'm sitting there taking pictures of whatever he's got hidden in that drawer, our cover's totally blown. What do we do if the package turns out to be a bomb? Kyle asked. If it is, Clyde could be planting it at any time, in just a few hours or something. I doubt it's tonight, Chloe said. Don't forget the second meeting. What meeting? Kerry asked. Something John picked up in one of Clyde's mobile calls, Chloe explained. He's got a meeting tonight at eight o'clock. Where? No idea where or who, Kerry. But groups like Help Earth keep information on potential attacks separate. One person deals with the device, another knows the target, and the attacker is only given the whole picture at the last minute. That way, the plan isn't compromised if anyone is caught. Kerry nodded. So, all these meetings mean the attack has to be coming soon. Almost certainly within the next 72 hours, Chloe said. What if Clyde isn't the attacker? Kyle asked. We've had this discussion, Chloe said, a touch wearily. Shu is a 16-year-old with no specialist knowledge. His only use to help Earth is as a lightning rod, an unlikely suspect who can take some of the risks that more senior people don't fancy. Right, Kerry said. I'll hook a two-way radio up under my t-shirt. As soon as I get in Clyde's room, I'll fix it in my ear. You guys watch on the video and speak to me if you see someone coming. Chloe gave Kerry a friendly rub on the back. You'd better hurry up and get changed before Rebecca starts wondering where you've got to.